Welcome to episode 581 of the Entertainment 2.0 podcast brought to you by the digitalmediazone.com. I'm Josh Pollard, and this is the show that puts you in control of your favorite movies, music, shows, and games. And it's another solo Josh show for you all. Uh, Richard is traveling this week. Like he bought a house and then he travels. That seems like uh, far too chaotic of a schedule for me, but that's what he's doing. So he's got the week off next week. I don't know what next week's going to look like yet because I am very excited that Jen and I are going to see a concert next Tuesday night. So maybe we'll record on Monday. Maybe we'll record on Wednesday. I don't know yet. So follow Twitter to find out for sure when that's going to happen next week. Uh, We normally like to start the show off with some listener feedback, but we don't have any this week. If you'd like to send us some for a future episode, you can email us at entertainment20 at thedigitalmediazone.com. So without any listener feedback, we get to jump straight into the news. First up, Plex is back in the news for us, and this is a good story. I'm happy about it. I think it's a good feature, but I think one of the things that surprised me the most about it is just how many words Plex was able to write about this small feature on their own blog post. It was an excessively long blog post to announce that they're combining their TV guides. So what what does that even mean? So Plex, of course, is the digital media streaming library service application that you can run on your own. You can run this on a NAS. You can run this on a computer that's running on your home network. And then the traditional model for it has always been that you've ripped a bunch of your movies and, and TV shows and things like that, thrown them on a big hard drive, and then you have a nice, very nice, very easy to use catalog of all of that stuff available for you to stream on basically anything, whether that's streaming sticks and game consoles and phones and tablets in your house or outside of your house. It all works on Plex and it works really well. We love it for that. Then of course, a few years ago, they added the ability to connect an HD home run tuner so that you could actually record, watch and record live TV over the air, which was a really nice welcome addition to have a DVR built into uh, such a great media server application uh, that we already knew and loved. And it it had its, its struggles at first, but it's definitely gotten better over the years. And then uh, a couple of years ago, they added what they've been, well, what is what has been free streaming live TV channels. And that's the thing. They call them live TV channels, but it's just streaming TV. Most of them are not actually live. Some of them might be, like Newsy is probably actually live, but most of these are just pre-recorded shows that they're just showing you know, lots and lots of effectively reruns on. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's mostly what cable is at this point outside of the occasional live news and sports. So uh, up until now, if you had an antenna hooked up, you would have a separate guide for that version of live TV from the guide of all of those free streaming channels, which it's a couple hundred streaming channels. And if you've got an antenna hooked up to your Plex box, well, you know, for some people they get four over the air channels. Some people are living in areas that get tons of channels and you might have 60 over the air channels. Uh, But up until now, they've always been separate guides. Now they've combined them into one guide And it's still super customizable. You would really want that because it's got a lot more channels in it. So you can favorite all of your channels that you actually care about. You can rearrange them so that all of the channels that you actually care about are at the top. 
all, all of that's good. And, and this is all still displayed in a traditional grid guide like we're used to seeing on TiVos and cable boxes and things like that. So it, it's a nice feature to have. Absolutely, it makes sense for them to combine it. I think they very much pitch this as, look how great it is to have all of your guides in one place when it might actually be more of a, a ploy to get them to, to get users to use the free streaming channels more. Maybe they, I, I don't want to speculate on, on how much people are using the free streaming channels, but this does seem like a way to get those free streaming channels in front of more people because now it's just going to be mixed in with your other over-the-air channels. If you want to check this out, it's out now uh, on what they like to call their big screen apps. So basically, any way that you can watch Plex on a television. So streaming sticks, Apple TV, gaming consoles, you know, all of those types of things. It's basically out on all of those now and rolling out to mobile devices and the web browser and things like that soon. We don't we don't have a date. It's just soon. It'll probably be within the next couple of weeks or so would be my guess. That's that's uh, uh, their typical rollout schedule for things like that. So our other video news story this week is from Sony. They are releasing a firmware update to their 2021, so last year's Sony Bravia XR TVs. And the Bravia XR TVs are typically their higher end TVs, like their OLEDs. And the main feature that, that we care about here that, that's in this firmware update is they are adding variable refresh rate, so VRR, to these TVs that already support up to 120 hertz. So this is really nice to have for all of these, well, I was going to say all of these next-gen gaming consoles, but there's only one next-gen gaming console that supports VRR right now. And that's the Xbox, the Series X and Series S both support this. PlayStation 5 still doesn't support VRR, but maybe this is a sign that it's actually coming soon. Maybe Sony didn't really want to release it on the PlayStation 5 until their own TVs supported the feature. That seems... Like maybe a bad idea, like oh, don't don't hold this back, or maybe it just doesn't matter, because if if you want a PlayStation Five or an Xbox Series X, they're both next to impossible to buy. So what does it really matter when they release these features? It does matter if you've already got these consoles. That that's who it really matters for. It's just that that's such a small number of people right now. Either way. I'm happy to see VRR coming to more TVs. It's such a great feature to have to eliminate that screen tearing when the game is not running at the same refresh rate as the TV. That's what causes that. We talked about this a little bit on the last episode, episode 380. If you want to hear me talk a little bit more about why variable refresh rate uh, is is important to gaming. It's really only important to gaming. This isn't an issue for for movies and, and TV and things like that. They're, I'm sure that someone's going to call me out on that. There's probably some movie out there that does have a refresh rate that changes or, or is a little bit more dynamic. But even if you're just talking about a movie that some scenes are like 24 hertz and others are 48 hertz, like that's that's not something you're even going to notice in that situation. We're, we're talking about games where the frame rate can change every second to, depending on lots of different conditions. And that can lead to a pretty poor experience if you've got a fixed refresh rate display. So this is really nice to see becoming a far more popular feature on televisions, especially now that gaming consoles are starting to support it. It's something that the, the PC gamers have had for years and years and years, like probably at least 10 years now, I'm thinking it's been around. Uh, it, it's primarily uh, been available through NVIDIA. Their technology is called G-Sync. AMD's line of GPUs 
use an open technology that does basically the same thing. It's called FreeSync. The Xbox One actually eventually had FreeSync built in. Uh, and now, of course, the Xbox Series X has VRR technology in it also. So there you go. If you've got a 2021 model of a Sony Bravia XR TV, go in and double check that you've got the latest firmware because you're ready for VRR now. Moving on to our audio news for the week, Sonos. They introduced a speaker called the Rome. You know, I now I don't remember. Was it last year? Was it the year before? Who can remember when anything came out over the last couple of years? Because it feels like the the last two years have either been 20 years or 20 minutes. I, I can't really tell. It's the COVID space-time continuum. I can't keep it straight anymore. Anyway, Sonos at some point released a speaker called the Sonos Roam, and it is a waterproof portable speaker that, that's still a Sonos speaker. And that speaker cost $179. It works as a Sonos speaker, which means it will connect to Wi-Fi and stream music over Wi-Fi like that, um, connect to all of your other Sono speakers to work in a multi-room audio environment. It also has a microphone built in that allows you to use the Microsoft, or sorry, the Google or Amazon assistants, the voice assistants with it. I won't say their names here so that I don't trip anybody's uh, smart speakers at home. And it, it, it's a pretty good speaker. Like it, it's really, I, I've, I've always kind of viewed the Rome as like the ideal entry point into the Sonos ecosystem because the, it's the lowest cost device that they have at $179. And if you're, if you don't have any smart speakers yet or, or anything like this, then you may not really be decided yet where you even want these things. You know, do you want it in your kitchen? Do you want it in your bathroom, your bedroom, in your office, on your deck? Like there are a lot of places that you could put a speaker like this. And if you buy one that's portable, you can try it out in all sorts of locations. So I, I think they're a great idea. Now, if you like the idea of, of a portable speaker like that, that you can listen to really high quality streaming music through it, but you really, really don't want a microphone on it. Well, you're about to have your opportunity to have that perfect device for you because they are releasing a new speaker that they're calling the Sonos Roam SL. And it's basically the exact same thing as the speaker that I just described, except it doesn't have the microphone. It still gives you 10 hours of battery life. It still works in a traditional Sonos uh, multi-room audio environment, allowing you to control it through the Sonos app on your phone or, or other devices. It just doesn't have a microphone, so you can't shout at it to tell it what music you want to listen to or other voice assistant type commands that you would yell over to to one of those types of devices. Now there is one other feature that you're missing out on by not having the microphone. And that's a feature that they call auto true play. And what that feature does is it plays some music and it uses the microphone to listen to how the music sounds in the room in which you're listening to music. So it can then tune the audio so that it sounds even better. It's a really cool feature, but it's probably not a feature that really matters that much on a portable speaker because you're probably not going to do this every single time you move it to a new room. Now, so, listen, some of you, let's, let's just be real here, right? It, it's just the two of us right now. We both know that if you're listening to this show, you're probably the type of person that is running uh, this this room correction on your speaker in every single room you move it to. 
your friends that that should buy this they're not going to do that though so if they don't need the microphone for the voice assistant features then this is a really great way to get into it now cutting out the microphone doesn't save you that much money it drops the price by 20 bucks so you can pick one of these up for 159 in my opinion even if you're not so sure about the the smart assistant technology for 20 bucks like you might as well just buy the one with the microphone in it in case you change your mind eventually you can always turn the microphone off so that that that's kind of my feeling on this uh, I, but I, I think this is a, a great option uh, o- offering great products at even lower prices has pretty much always been a successful model for pretty much every device out there. So I think Sonos is going to do well here, but it would still be my recommendation. And I'm just going to guess Richard's too, that you just go out and buy the regular Rome if you're thinking about this at all. If you do want the Rome SL, you can pre-order it now and they will start shipping on March 15th. So you don't even actually need to wait all that long. All right, off to our gaming news segment for the night. First up is the Valve Steam Deck. The reviews are out. Not for me, I don't have one, (laughs) but there are reviews out. We're gonna link to the one from The Verge in the show notes here. So if you wanna read all of the details, then uh, feel free to to check that out. The, the highlights here, basically, it sounds like the Steam Deck, which as a reminder is a portable gaming PC that really looks like a Nintendo Switch. Now, it's a much bigger Switch. A An entire Nintendo Switch would fit in between the joysticks on the Steam Deck. So that that gives you an idea of just how much wider the Steam Deck is than a Nintendo Switch. They're they're pretty large. There's a lot of good things here. Uh, It does play a lot of games. It doesn't play absolutely everything, but it plays a lot of games. And for a lot of those games, it plays them really well. Even at, at 60 frames per second or more. The important thing to remember there is that it it plays them really well in that handheld mode when you're driving a very small, low resolution screen, right? Like this is not a 4K screen built into this thing. I I believe it's a 720p screen. So it's not super high res. It doesn't need to have as much power to drive the frame rates on that type of display. And that's okay, it's a small screen. We're not talking about a 65 inch TV in front of you. You don't need a super high res screen, even if all of these phones that we're buying nowadays have 4K screens and things like that. You don't need it on a device that small. So that does enable a lot of games to to run really well on this thing. Also, all of the different controls that they have on it, whether that be the the d-pad it's got analog sticks it's got the it's got like square shaped touch panels that kind of sim they're they're, it's probably easiest to think of them like a trackpad on a laptop but those allow you to to really have all sorts of different control options and that means that you can play pc games across pretty much any genre of games on a on a handheld pc like it sounds like by and large the the mission that they set out to achieve here which is allow you to play all of your not all of your games you know but the vast majority of your pc games that you would want to play anywhere on a comfortable device because Playing PC games on a laptop is not necessarily the most enjoyable way of doing it and not the most convenient for things like on an airplane, on the bus, things like that. It kind of sounds like they succeeded there. It does actually work. It, it's not perfect. It's far from perfect. And, and that's where we get into to some of the cons. This thing is super, like it. what the reviewers are saying is it feels like an early access release. It is super buggy. 
Not everything works. There's tons and tons of tweaking that needs to be done for some games to run well. And for for you avid PC gamers, you're used to tweaking things. Maybe that's one of the things that you really love about PC gaming is that you can change so many different audio and video settings and things like that to get it just how you want it. Well, hopefully you do like that because it sounds like to get games running really well on the Steam Deck, you're going to be tweaking a lot of things. Uh, And it's one of those things that's good and bad, right? Like when I pick up a game, I don't necessarily want to tweak a bunch of things. I just want to play it. But if you're into that, not only can you just like turn down the resolution and texture details and things like that to get better frame rates. But you can also change things like, I'm playing a game that came out in the 90s and this thing could probably render at 300 frames per second and it'll do it and it'll burn through the the CPU and the GPU, which will burn through your battery. But what they've done is they've added software to this that allows you to scale that stuff back. Like just run it at 30 or 60 frames per second and let the CPU and GPU take a break while it's playing these old games. And what that gives you is longer battery life. And that's what you're going to want. Because if you're playing more modern games, you're probably only going to get about two hours of battery life out of this thing. And that's not great. That's not really going to get you through many flights. It'll probably get you through your daily commute if you're taking the train to work every day or something like that. But you're not going to be sitting down for for marathon sessions. You know, maybe you and a a friend are planning a a long cross-country road trip and you're thinking, great, I will bring the Steam Deck and I'm going to play video games on the Steam Deck the whole time they're driving. Well, you better bring a power adapter because two hours of battery life is just, it's really not great. It's not super surprising, but I think uh, most people would have hoped that maybe we could have gotten a little bit more battery life out of it. We'll see if maybe future tweaks to the system uh, can eke a little bit more power out of it. But in the end, it sounds like a pretty good device as long as you're willing to deal with and a piece of early access hardware and software. So go and check out some of the other app or some of the other reviews if you're still interested. If you are interested, you know what? You're going to have time for them to fix some of these issues because it's going to be months before they've made enough to ship you one if you want to go out and buy one today. You're going to be waiting months to receive it. Next up is another big launch that happened this week, and that is Amazon Luna, which you might be thinking, what are you talking about, Josh? Launch? Like, this has been available for months. I think it's been available for more than a year at this point. That's true, but it's basically been another early access sort of thing. It is now generally available to basically all customers who would want to use it in the mainland United States. Apparently, they don't have this rolled out on data centers all around the world or even in, you know, some of the more remote areas of the United States. Like they probably don't have data centers in Alaska and Hawaii is my guess. And since Luna is a game streaming service, you're going to need a solid Internet connection uh, between you and those game streaming servers. So. Amazon Luna is very similar to Google Stadia, to play, uh, to NVIDIA GeForce Now, and of course, Microsoft's own Xbox cloud game streaming service that's available as part of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. So there are some differences, though. It has kind of a confusing, but definitely more more options for their pricing. You can actually use this for free if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, which if you're in the US, pretty decent chance you already are. And that's 
that's really going to work more as like a a free trial, like an extended free trial, because there is a seven day free trial of the regular Luna Pro service. But if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, you're going to get access to a rotating library of roughly four games. And man, if you remember the days of me trying to share with you the schedules for the games with gold from Xbox, uh, the schedule here is even more confusing. Definitely not going to try and do that because some of the games are there for longer than, than others. Right now, if you want to check this out, the best game that's available for free in uh, for, for the Amazon Prime subscribers is Devil May Cry 5. The other ones you've probably not even heard of and are, are definitely more in the the casual game segment. To really get the most out of Luna, you're going to need to pay for one of their other subscription services. And and the primary one is is just called Luna Plus because of course it has a plus after it. And this is the service that gives you access to streaming over 100 you know, main main tier games, you know, games that you would play on an Xbox or a PC or a PlayStation or something like that. All of the games you've heard of, they're available on Luna Plus. And the regular price for that is going to be $9.99 a month if you sign up after April 1st. To which you're thinking, what do you mean after April 1st? You said it's available now. It is available now. And if you sign up now, do I sound like a telemarketer at this point? Or uh, <laughs> do I sound like Billy Mays? If you sign up now, you get access to it at a discounted rate. It'll be $5.99 a month, saving you four bucks a month. And it's not just an introductory rate that goes away after a month or, or even six months or a year. They're saying that this introductory rate will last as long as you maintain your subscription. So you could lock in this price forever. It won't actually be forever, but they want you to think that it'll be forever. They've also got another plan that's called the Family Channel. This is a even lower cost option. The regular price on this would also be $5.99 a month. This is family focused games and a lot more casual things. You know, it's got your kart racers and some puzzle games and um, Overcooked is in there. That That's probably the one that, that I've actually played and enjoyed the most out of that collection. But you know, it, it's more games that you would play with your kids or maybe games that you would feel more comfortable having your kids play. Again, that's regularly going to be $5.99 a month, but if you sign up now, Family Channel is $2.99 a month. There's also a Retro Channel, which has a decent list of retro arcade and console games. That does not have one of these introductory offers. It's just $4.99 a month. That one seems a little pricey to me. I think it's got a smaller library than the family channel, which I I guess makes, I mean, it is a dollar. Yeah, it is a dollar less than the family channel, but it's not that many. I, I don't know. It just seems like it should be less. And maybe that's just me discounting the fact that it's retro games. And there are so many other ways to play retro games, but none of them are going to be as convenient as Amazon Luna, I, I would think. That's not all. There are two more options here. There's a Jackbox game subscription, which gives you access to all of the Jack Jackbox games, all of them, but only them, none of the these other things. And that will also set you back $4.99 a month. And there's no introductory rate on that either. It's just $4.99 a month to play all of the Jackbox games. Or here's the last one, Ubisoft Plus. This is the really interesting one. This might be the one for you super hardcore gamers because it, it's access to games like Assassin's Creed, The Division, uh, you know, some of their other games that aren't just open world shooters like Steep. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of games in this collection. And this one is going to set you back some more money, though. This is $18 a month. 
But Ubisoft Plus, they're not just giving you like the base versions of these games. It's the base version plus all of the DLC. So it's, you know, if there's an ultimate edition of the game, that's the version that's available inside of Ubisoft Plus. So that's all of the different pricing tiers for Amazon Luna that you can get right now. They've also got the controller discounted. We talked about this a little bit on last week's show, but their controller, much like Google's Stadia controller, connects directly to their cloud. It is a Wi-Fi based controller, not Bluetooth. It connects through your Wi-Fi connection straight to their servers, which in theory gives you even lower latency and a better gaming experience. That controller is currently discounted to $49 from the regular $69 price. So if you're at all interested and you're already a Prime subscriber, which of course you are, I would say check this out with, say, Devil May Cry 5 because that's really a great game to check this out with. It is a fast-paced action game. You know, if you're concerned about latency impacting your your gameplay, it's a perfect game to try that out with. Use a Bluetooth controller and try it. And that's going to be worst case for you. If it works, buy yourself their controller and then sign up for one of these other packages while it's discounted and go on your merry way and be happy. Because I keep saying this, I really do think that these game streaming services are going to be I don't want to say that that they're the the way that we're going to game in the future and that that's going to be it and that consoles are going to die and no one's going to build gaming PCs anymore. But this model is just going to get more and more popular because it just makes so much sense as long as you have a good internet connection. All right, our last news story is for the PC gamers out there. And that is a fairly important update to the Xbox app. That's, of course, how... Most, most users are going to get Xbox games installed on their Windows PC, especially if you're looking for Game Pass games. The, the big update here is that they're giving you far more control. In fact, I would probably think it, a, a fair description would be they're giving you the control that you've been wanting and, and kind of deserving for years. And that is the ability to control where the games are installed. That sounds ridiculous if you've been a Steam game player or or basically any other version of, of a PC gamer in the past. This is a new thing on, on the Xbox side. Because the Xbox game store is really built on top of the Windows app store, right? guess they actually call it the Microsoft Store. They've had a bunch of limitations built into how these things get installed. The The most flexible that it really started to get over the last couple of years is that you could at least choose which hard drive you were going to install the games to. But even then, every game would get installed in inside of the Windows Apps folder in the root of that hard drive. So you couldn't control if you wanted, say, the the games that you're playing the most to be on your C drive, which might be a super fast SSD or you know one of these NVMe storage devices. And then maybe the games that you don't care about as much, or maybe they're casual games and you know things like that that you just don't play super frequently. You put those on a slower spinning disk hard drive. That wasn't an option because you had to install all games on one drive and within one folder. That's changing now. When you go to install a game, it's going to ask you, where do you want this? And that means which drive and which folder. And it can be completely different from the other games that you have installed. If you've already installed games, you can use this new version of the app to move them. So it's not like you have to remove them and completely reinstall them or anything like that. You can just use this app to move them now. It's also going to, this flexibility is also going to make game modding easier. The mods pretty much always require you to go in and replace files and stuff like that, which for the Windows apps folder, that wasn't an easy thing to do. It was a hidden folder. It was protected. 
It was a giant pain. That doesn't have to be the case anymore. So this is going to be a very welcome change for any PC gamers who have been using the Xbox app to install games from the Xbox store. Well, that's it for our news this week. So we'll jump into what's going on in our entertainment centers. I, of course, have to say news with the absolutely devastating situation going on in Ukraine. Uh, Definitely been watching more news than I typically would. (sighs) Absolutely heartbreaking what's going on over there. And and I'm not really sure what I can say that isn't already being said in, in lots of other, you know, news sites and things like that. But definitely hearts go out to everybody in Ukraine and what they're having to deal with. Um, I it, It's not lost on me that I can sit here on a Tuesday night and record a silly podcast about entertainment news while people in, in Ukraine are being pointlessly attacked by a madman. It's just, it's just insane. So... Uh, of course, watching lots of news there. Uh, when I need a break from that, still some gaming going on, of course. NHL, of course. But also, I I think I mentioned last week, I, I, I was talking about how I don't really have like a game that I can just pick up and play in short burst. When it, it, and, and a game that I can do that even if I haven't played it for a month or something where I don't have to try and remember all of the super complicated controls or remember where I am in the story or anything like that. And I found a game that works for that. And it's not a new game for me. It's not a new game at all, but it is a game that's on Game Pass and it's Dirt Rally 2.0, uh, the second version of the pretty hardcore rally racing games from uh, from the makers of the Dirt franchise. Dirt Rally is a very different experience than, say, Dirt 5 or something like that. It is a hardcore rally racing game that is a lot more challenging than than Dirt and a lot less arcadey, and, and there's not all of the extra different fun things and stuff that the Dirt games have. It is pretty much just focused on traditional rally racing and rally cross. And it's something I can just fire up, run through a few stages, enjoy it, be done. Like I know the controls, it's gas, brake, e-brake, maybe you're shifting. There's not a whole lot there to figure out. It's real easy to pick up and play. And I love, love, love rally racing. So that's that's been great. And then I also started and finished a book within the last week, an audiobook, of course. And I couldn't remember if I've talked about this book before because I know I had started it, but I'm pretty sure I didn't finish it because I only remembered the first third or so of the book. It's a book called The Three Body Problem. It's a uh, hard sci-fi book uh, from a Chinese author. It's it's really, it's got a really interesting story. I don't want to say too much about it. I'm not sure what would be on the back cover. Um, that would be kind of spoilery. Uh, but if you're, if you're into what they call hard sci-fi, which, which means like it's actually got a lot of science that they work through in, in the book, similar to like the Martian, you know, in, in the Martian, you're, you're inside the main character's head as he's trying to figure out how to live on Mars all by himself. Not at all the same sort of situation here. These are these are people who are on Earth. Um, but kind of a somewhat realistic uh, potential idea for, for a very intriguing story. It's a three-book series, I believe. I've only read the first book. I know there are at least three books. And they're also turning it into a Netflix series. They don't have a date on it yet. I'm thinking maybe next year. So plenty of time for you to get out there and and read it. If you like hard sci-fi, it's definitely worth checking out. The Three Body Problem. All right, well, that's it for what's going on in my entertainment center. Hopefully we're going to be back next week. We're going to find, hopefully we're going to find some time and hopefully 
we'll have Richard back and everything will align and it'll be the two of us with lots of big news to talk about and we'll be able to do it live just like tonight I was able to do the show live and we've got a few people in the chat always making it more interesting we typically do this Tuesday nights around 8 30 p.m eastern you can subscribe to us on twitch to to get notified by twitch as soon as we go live or you can follow us on twitter richard is at richard gunther i'm at josh pollard and the website is at digimediazone and we always tweet about when the show will be going live also all the rest of our contact information, the email address, the Facebook, like all of that other stuff is out on the the website, www.thedigitalmediazone.com, where we also have show notes for everything that we talked about tonight. If you want more details on the Valve Steam Deck or any of the other stories that we talked about, all of the links are out there in the show notes. You're also going to have a link to our YouTube page. When we record the show live, we also publish it to YouTube afterwards so that you can see the video feed of it. It's just a little bit more fun, we think. So uh, thank you so much for for listening today. Thank you to everybody who's in the live chat. We absolutely love having you here. Uh, Tony's in the chat right now, and he's saying the tweet is the only reason he even remembers when the show is going to happen live. And maybe that has more to do with the fact that I'm not the greatest at keeping the schedule the same. Either way, it's great to have him here uh, and everybody else who's in the chat tonight. Hopefully we will see you on a future episode because that's going to do it for episode 581. I'm Josh Pollard. Thanks for listening to Entertainment 2.0. Adios.